we have a let's go to the nursery. So
Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you today. I got a little flustered this morning. The preacher got a little long and beat the preacher today. So I felt like I was behind the schedule. But I made it. Good to be with you. A uh, few announcements. First, today, Paul Davis is here. He told me this morning that he works for students, so I gave him a lot of sympathy. Yeah, students woke up. Oh, what, a, what a blessing for two Christian men to be able to work together. Uh, Cole is here representing the Gideons and uh, will present to us uh, what has been happening in the ministry, but also give us opportunity to contribute toward Bibles at the end of the service. So, I want to encourage you, uh, I uh, am so appreciative, as you know, for the ministry where we trust that God will keep his promise concerning his word, that it won't return empty, but that it will accomplish the purpose for which he sends it. So I want to encourage you to, to uh, be generous, and let's get God's word out to as many people as we possibly can, and uh, keep the Gideons in our prayers as, as they uh, distribute God's word. We have opportunity to purchase it. Um, council will be meet after church today. And Brian, it's going to be a long meeting, right? Yes. You're being sarcastic, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing. I don't know what that means. Anyway, so council members, please come meet uh, downstairs after church today. And, and maybe, maybe I could ask Brian and Marla, would you agree? No, you've got to be down there. You and Rolf again? Okay. If you and Rolf would greet people after church today, then we can get started right away. Because I guess it's going to be till 3 or 4 o'clock sometimes. Okay. <laughs> there, there is a mistake. Youth for Christ does not be here tomorrow. They have a general meeting, but do continue to keep them in prayer. As, as they continue to do the ministry among both middle school and high school students. Uh, we continue confirmation at 5 o'clock on Wednesday and next Sunday is our usual schedule. We have something happening this week, however. The drain pipes in Emmanuel may be known uh, at times have clogged up with roots and we still have roots growing in them even though the trees are gone. So Wednesday, a company from Bismarck is coming to to leave all the roots out that are growing in. And then, if you plan on coming to the church building uh, on Thursday or Friday or Saturday, the water will not be on. So make sure you don't need to use a bathroom or the sinks or anything like that when you come. We need to give the epoxy that they're going to put the pipes, that they're going to line the pipes for the time to dry. So, just a, a heads up uh, as a uh, Things will be back functioning again Sunday, but uh, between between Wednesday night and Sunday, um, can't can't use that stuff. <clears throat> Reminder of the Bible study we're going to begin in January uh, concerning the weaker brother from Romans uh, 14, and then a reminder to two weeks from today. Okay. November 18th. Is that a week from today? Oh. Wow. What happened to the year? A week from today is Praise Sunday. And uh, we, we take a special offering along with our regular offering on that day toward the uh, physical needs of, of our church building. I don't like to call it our church because the church are the people who are here. But the church building. And uh, that will also be our Thanksgiving service. And we will have a dinner after church that Sunday. We look forward to the fellowship afterwards. The daily breaks for December, January, February are here. They're on the table in the back. Be sure you pick one up on your way out today or next week. And uh, December is going to be here before I know it. Just like Praise Sunday is here before I know it. So uh, be sure you get those and are ready. I use them. There's plenty of them. Make sure you grab, not only for yourselves, but if you have neighbors or friends, uh, shut in somewhere who you know would be blessed by 
spending time in God's Word daily and having this guide to God's Word, please grab, grab some copies for them. And if we run out on the table, I'll put more out there. One more announcement. Today is a very special day. It's Veterans Day. And we are here worshiping freely because we have people in our nation who have been willing to sacrifice a great deal, and many of them pay a great price in order that we could have the freedom that we do. Not only the freedom to gather and worship and to speak God's word clearly without anyone telling us uh, that we can't say certain things. Very grateful for that. But the, the peace that we enjoy in this nation as well has been bought dearly. If there are any veterans in our congregation today, I want to ask you, could you please stand at this time? And Jerry, maybe, correct? And maybe also Scott? Yep. Maybe not. Okay. Say yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you for your service.
Our first two scripture lessons today uh, have us looking at some widows. Uh, two of them that uh, are presented uh, with regard to their stories. They, they're they actually uh, people that we meet. One reference to widows from Jesus' teaching and about how widows are often abused. The setting for our first lesson in 1 Kings is Elijah, the prophet of God in, in Israel, the northern kingdom, as, as Israel and Judah had been divided. And as he was faithful in proclaiming God's word, one thing he proclaimed is that there would be uh, no rain for three and a half years. How would that be for your farming, uh, Bill? You don't like that? Um, yeah, boy, I tell you, Brian's are shaking his head. Not very good, and it wasn't very good. And uh, they didn't have storage like we do nowadays, so there was a lack of food. There was a, a great deal of concern uh, with regard to people starving. Elijah, however, was taken care of by God. First of all, he was brought to a brook that was flowing longer than other brooks were. And uh, he, he got water there, and also ravens were sent to him, big black birds sent to him, and they brought him food. God can use all kinds of creatures and did to feed Elijah until the brook ran dry. And then God sent Elijah to a very strange place. Uh, you would think that God would say, you know, the king has plenty. Why don't you go to his house? And he'll take care of you. He'll feed you until the drought is over. That's what makes sense to us. But that's not where he sent Elijah. And our text today tells us where he did send Elijah. In, again, chapter 17 of 1 Kings, we're going to begin at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. What a Gentile territory along the coast. Stay there. I commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So Elijah went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there, gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, interesting, the Lord your God, she's speaking of the God of Israel. People in Zarephath and Sidon worshipped Baals. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son. And we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me. From what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word the Lord spoke and spoken by Elijah. An amazing miracle. Our second lesson is from the Gospel of Mark, and it speaks of Jesus in the temple, and he's teaching about the teachers of the law, and about how they like prominent places and actually abuse widows. They devour widows' houses, Jesus says. And then we get to meet a widow at the temple in this text, Mark 12, 38 through 44. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces. They have the most important seats in the synagogues in the places of honor and banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. 
Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Here is the reading of our first two lessons. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be in this house of the Lord again. It's been a few years, but it's a wonderful, wonderful sanctuary. I have a question for you. Have you heard of anybody being saved in a submarine? Well, a few years ago in a U.S. nuclear submarine off the coast, the Atlantic coast, a sailor named Stan gave his life to the Lord. He was given a testament by the Gideons in boot camp at Great Lakes Naval Training Center in Illinois. I grew up there and heard reveling and taps every day. One night, about 400 feet below the ocean, Stan got on his knees and surrendered his life to God. He says, God's word opened my eyes to just how terribly messed up my heart was. I thank God for his word, and I thank you, Gideons, for putting this little testament into my hands. As many of you know, Gideons is an international organization of businessmen, professional men, who attend churches such as your own. Our goal is to put a copy of God's word into the hands of everybody in the world doesn't if they don't have one. And God's passion is our passion. We want to see people repent and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And for over 110 years, Gideons have been doing that in, in over 200 countries, handing out copies of God's Word. We go into hospitals and jails and military places and colleges and high schools and grade schools. And anywhere the door is open, that we're asked to come, we will go. And so we're in over 200 countries. And the time I have to speak to you today, 1,800 copies of God's Word, whether a little testament or a Bible that goes into a hotel room, is placed. That's over a million every four days. And 
It's all because of the faithful support. And, and, and please, think of the Gideons as an extended arm of your church. And you have Gideons in this church. And they, they, they participate. And they go and, and play scriptures and speak in churches. And give reports like this. A 24-year-old man named Clovis from Chile was skilled at stealing wallets. One day he took something that looked like a wallet full of money only to discover when he returned to his hiding place that it was a Gideon New Testament. Angry, he threw it to the ground. Yet later that night, unable to sleep, he picked up the Testament and he started to read. He wrote the Gideons that a few days later he surrendered his life to Christ and is serving the Lord now. Another story, Sidney Baraku was raised an atheist in Albania. That's over Eastern Europe, Eastern Bloc countries. One day while he was traveling in neighboring Greece, he was handed a New Testament by the Gideons while walking around town. Out of curiosity, he began to read the Bible. Uh, his contempt, he had contempt, he was an atheist, he had contempt for organized religion. And so when he was reading the Bible, and he was, learning about the Pharisees and the scribes and how they treated Jesus, who seemed to be just a man who came to love and to heal, he was disgusted. And he, he, he threw it down like Clovis did. And then he said, no, i got to find out why, why did this Jesus do his life? And he read more. And in an instant, the Holy Spirit, he says, convicted him. And he gave his life to the Lord. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God goes forth and it, it does not return void. These stories and many others like them are about people who come to know Jesus through God's written Word. And many times it occurs with nobody else in the world. Just the Spirit working through His Word to convict and to lead people to the same knowledge. The problem is, as you know, there are many people in the world, many, who don't know, who've never had the opportunity to read God's Word. And that's why I'm here today. That's why the Gideons have been doing this. That's why you've supported the Gideons for years, your church. In one village, the Gideons revisited. They found... The villagers had run, they didn't have enough Bibles. They didn't, the Gideons had been there before, and for some reason they, they didn't have enough. And they found that certain, certain testaments had been carefully taken apart. And they had a system of, of sharing pages out of the Bible in this, this village. Pretty amazing. Bob Argus is, is a businessman in, in Phoenix. And he, uh, uh, his wife kicked him out. He was an alcoholic, and so he stayed in the hotel room, and of course, you know how the story's going to go. He found a Gideon Bible, but he didn't like it. He threw it up under the bed. Well, goes to work, comes back, a new Bible, the Bible is sitting on the bed table. And he, he, he tried to get rid of the Bible. He even went out one night when he got home and threw it in the dumpster. Well, he got back the next day, there was another one. And he was really convicted. He, he, was, he, was, he opened up the words. There's got to be some reason why this book keeps showing up. And he opened it up. And he read. And he gave his life to the Lord that night. He quit drinking. Went home to his wife. Reconciled. He is now serving the Lord. So, there are three ways that you can help. And you probably already have. Through prayer through financial giving, and through the Gideon card program, I have one that's in memory. And many of you have used these, where you can have Bibles placed in a person's name, in memory, or recognition, or if you're just thinking about somebody, you want to bless them, and they're low, or they're, they're suffering, you can send them a card saying, I've placed so many Bibles in your name. It's a wonderful way. But your prayers are are much needed. We have Gideons that are putting their life on. Auxiliary. The wives of the Gideons are called the Auxiliary. And they're in countries 
where it's not safe to be a Christian. And yet they're there putting the Bibles out. We need prayer for the opportunities. We need prayer for funds. We need prayer for the city. And every dollar, I like saying this, in, in the Gideons, every single penny, every single dollar that you give goes to buying scripture and distributing it. It doesn't go to the Gideon organization. Our dues pay for the running of the organization. And so that's a wonderful thing to be able to say. That you know that God's word is going to be born. They won't return. I thank you, Pastor, for this opportunity to share. I enjoy telling people these stories of what God is doing. With his word. Thank you. God's word is that powerful. So I want to encourage all of us. Well, thank you, Gideon's students. Cole, I know our Gideons, but we've got a bunch of them in our congregation. And the others that are being uh, getting nervous just a little bit. You really ought to be involved. It's a great opportunity to get God's word out. And God's word does not return in you. It accomplishes the purpose for which he sends it. So, I want to encourage you to consider leaving a gift to me to purchase Bibles. Who knows who we're going to meet in heaven as God's word is distributed and as people pick it up and God speaks to the hearts and calls people to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Well, today we're going to look at our Hebrews text. <clears throat> the, um, the other two texts we look at, looked at today that had to do with widows have often been used as a, a platform for examples of faith or examples of principles. Uh, faith, boy, both those women are excellent examples of faith, are they not? This uh, widow at Zarephath, well, what an amazing thing that is Elijah's foreigner came and kind of told her, you know, give me some bread right first and your jar and your jug will not run out. And, and she does. She brings him a cake. Here she is. No way to make a living herself. And besides, things weren't good anywhere at that time. With the drought that was occurring, she trusts Elijah as he brings the word of God to her and brings him a cake. And sure enough, God keeps his word. What we need to pay attention to in that text is that that's exactly what Elijah brought her is the word of God. The God of Israel says that your jar won't run empty and your jug will not run empty. And to see this, this widow at the temple, you know, we don't learn a lot about the, the widow at Zarephath after Elijah left. We don't learn anything about her. We also don't learn anything about this woman at the temple who had very little less than a penny, a fraction of a penny, we're told was her offering. I, I think it would have been interesting to stand there that day and we could learn a lot of lessons about her faith as well or from her faith. It's a good example again to us as people were showing up, putting in uh, their great big gifts of silver and gold and jewels and impressing all the people that were there. Well, look what he gave. Look what he gave. Well, he did better than all of them. And she only had two little copper coins. She must have been rather shy to drop them in compared to all the other gifts that were given, and yet Jesus draws attention to her, knowing what she was doing, knowing that she too, being a poor widow in a society that did not support widows well, put everything that she had in, in the offering that day. We might use that to say, here's great examples of faith, now you go and do the same thing. I find a message like that really discouraging. Because uh, a lot of times I've seen people do great things and I've thought, I'm going to improve, I'm going to become more like so-and-so. And it hasn't happened yet. I haven't gotten there yet. You know, observing others' deeds that come from faith are, are a great thing. We rejoice when we see them happen, but they really don't help us become better at all. We also hear people turn these 
a concept of ways and principles. If, if you only trust the Lord, that box of cereal in your cupboard will never go empty. That happened yet? No, not to me either. I don't eat cereal anymore. Or anything, but you understand uh, principle. I remember when we lived in Ferndale, Washington, and there was a Christian radio station that was doing their fundraising, and they used accounts such as these to say, you know, if you send a big gift to us, more than you can afford, you can be sure God will give you all kinds of riches, that you will never be able to outgive God with regard to riches. Well, we certainly can't outgive God. That's true. But does that mean that God will reward our giving of material blessings with greater material blessings? Sometimes maybe. There's no guarantee in God's word that it'll be material blessings that he returns to us. We don't have that promise. What lesson do we have then from these two widows that we look at in our text today? What, what should we be drawn to? Just their example of faith that doesn't really help us have faith? I don't know, I tried really hard to have more faith. I don't know how to exercise it. It, it just doesn't grow by willpower. And also, I don't trust those who say, you know, you give me a lot of money and God's going to give you even more. Uh, they seem to fly around in big airplanes and drive fancy cars and live in big mansions. And I seem to have about the same as before. What are we to learn from these widows? I think the clue for what we are to learn is found in our epistle text today. That focuses on Christ entering a sanctuary that was not man-made. Unlike all of the priests that had gone before him who entered the Holy of Holies year after year after year for hundreds of years in Jerusalem and before that in a tabernacle uh, that traveled through the wilderness with the people of Israel and remained the place of worship for many years after, until after the time of King David. We see Jesus, who he is, what he did. We see the promises of God fulfilled. And in finding that, we find the foundation for the faith that we see exercised. We see not only its foundation, we see its source. Where does that faith come from? It comes from, well, the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word. You told us that. Romans 10. It comes from hearing the promises of God. It comes from fixing our eyes not on our faith and not on principles, but fixing our eyes on who God is and what he did for us. We see in our text that Jesus entered heaven itself. For hundreds of years, the priests had entered the Holy of Holies. They entered and they couldn't enter into where God said his presence would be without blood. They had to bring the sacrifice of a sin offering in and sprinkle the blood in the Holy of Holies time after time after time. And the tabernacle and the temple reminded or was supposed to remind the people of Israel that God is a gracious God who welcomes sinners and calls them his people, who makes them his own. But he does it not by a, a price they pay, not by their deeds, not by their works, but by a sacrifice of somebody not themselves. That God has forgiveness of sins for people, that even though we rebel against him, he longs for us to come back and is willing to forgive, call us his children and treat us then as his children. Happened time after time after time. It's interesting then that first of all with the widow at Zarephath, she's given the word of God. Elijah didn't just say, oh, go ahead and do it. He said, the Lord, the God of Israel, said. 
and gives her the word of God to focus on, this woman who gave her gift, all that she had to live on, was standing right in front of a message as well. It was in the temple courts. The temple courts where there was that reminder time and time and time again that blood would be shed not her own, somebody else's. Because God loved her and God promised to take care of her. God promised that she'd be taken care of not only for time but for all eternity. And so as she dropped what she had in the offering dish, bowl, whatever it was, in the temple courts, she was responding to the promise of God that was there day by day by day. The promise of God, the word of God that was speaking through the deeds of the priests who were offering sacrifice and bringing once a year uh, the blood of that atoning sacrifice into the Holy of Holies. We have much more than either of those widows had. What do we have? Our text tells us Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary. He didn't go into the temple. He didn't go into the tabernacle. He didn't make something that was a pattern of what the heavenly dwelling is like. Those were only a copy. Jesus entered the presence of God. Jesus entered the true sanctuary. We're told he entered heaven itself. We can look back and see that one who shed his blood ended all the temple sacrifices because now the sacrifice all those pointed to was complete when he entered heaven himself. He entered heaven himself, himself itself now to appear in God's presence for us. And that's the point in Christ we see clearly that God is a keeper of his promises, and his promises tell us that he is going to forgive our sins. He is going to make us his children. That you and I are going to be made children of God. And in Jesus we see that the accomplishment of that task is complete. So Jesus appears in heaven in the presence of God on our behalf. Where does faith come from? Faith does not come from our effort to work up faith inside of us. Faith comes, trust comes, when we fix our eyes on what somebody else has done for us that's truly a benefit. With my confirmation kids back at Beaver Creek, I've used the example recently of the guy in the wheelbarrow. The guy on the tightrope, the guy who walks across the tightrope over and over again until the crowds are drawn and, and then pushes a wheelbarrow across and puts a big sack of cement in the wheelbarrow back and forth and back and forth. What is he doing? He's proving to the crowds that he has a great ability to cross that tightrope. Even with a great weight inside the wheelbarrow and then after a big show and there's a big crowd gathered, he says, how many believe that I could push a human being across that tightrope way above the ground in the wheelbarrow. And the crowd's going, yeah, I knew you could do it. They're enthusiastic and excited. He's proved that he could. Okay, where's the volunteer? We'll step in. If anybody did step in, well, it, it wouldn't be blind faith, would it? You know, if I was up there and I was pushing the wheelbarrow back and forth across that tightrope and I said, anybody want to ride the wheelbarrow? Uh, well, first of all, I wouldn't be pushing it back and forth to start with. I'd be up there with a wheelbarrow standing on the platform saying, anybody want to hop in? I'm going to push this across. You'd be insane to say, I'll play. I, I couldn't get it across. I and they would both fall to the ground. Probably the last fall we'd ever have. Why would people trust a man who had done it over and over and over again? And the answer is because they'd seen him do it over and over and over again. The object of their faith would have proved himself faithful. So when we look at the faith of these two women, we hear the word of God, we see that 
that the one heard the word of God, we don't know what else she was given, and, and trusted Elijah the prophet, the other also had the word of God present. The faithfulness of God in keeping the people of Israel and forgiving their sins through what was faithfully provided by God, the blood of animals and the priesthood that he had established. The word of God was present, and as they kept their eyes fixed on the promises of God's word and how he would fulfill them, they were able to entrust their very lives into God's hands. Jesus has fulfilled everything that the temple promised, everything that the word of God promised. God's word says that all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. All that had taken place before points us to Jesus, and now we see that God has kept his promise of forgiveness of sins and of making us reconciled to him not only for time but for all eternity to be our loving father while we live on this earth. He doesn't promise that we'll get everything we want. Indeed, he makes very, very clear that we're going to go through some tough times while we're on this earth, but not alone. And like a good shepherd, he will be with us every step of the way, not only as he's giving us green pastures and still waters, but also as he's calling us to go through the valley of the shadow of death. His rod and his staff will be with us, comforting us, that he'll be with us every day of our lives, and that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, not because we've accomplished such a goal, we never could, but because by his promise and by what he delivers, that goal is accomplished. Jesus appears for us, he appears for us in the heavenly realms, in the sanctuary that's not made with human hands. He appears for us to be our advocate. The priests always appeared with blood in the Old Testament, in the, in the tabernacle and in the temple. They always appeared with blood. So did Jesus. They appeared with blood over and over and over again because the blood they appeared with only pointed forward to the blood that would truly atone for sins. We're told in our text by the writer to the, this letter to the Hebrews that when Jesus entered this heavenly sanctuary, he brought a sacrifice as well. Unlike the priests that had to appear again and again, he brought one sacrifice that completed the need for sacrifices. Even as death comes to us once and after that the judgment, Jesus died once for all, for you, for me, for everybody who lives around the world today, for everybody who's ever lived, he appeared with a sacrifice, and that sacrifice is himself. He shed his blood. God is a just judge. And our sins demand God's justice. Our faith is not what it ought to be. Our faith isn't often like the widows that we've read about in our text today. Maybe it should be. But it isn't. And I'm sure their faith wasn't always what we read about in this text either. Are they saved by perfect faith? And the answer is no. They're saved by faith in a perfect Savior. A Savior that was promised through the temple worship. A, a Savior that's promised through the speaking of the Word of God. A Savior that came. A Savior who is Jesus. A Savior who's both high priest and drink. The sanctuary not man-made, but entering with shed blood, entering with atonement, entering with satisfaction of justice, with the sacrifice of himself, he enters. And so it won't happen again and again. We're told in verse 28, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. But we're told also that he will appear one more time. He will appear a second time. And this time it won't be like the priests before who came to, be, to offer sacrifice again and again and again. No sacrifice is needed anymore. He's coming again to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. We might say, wait a minute, I thought through faith in Christ I have salvation. And the answer is yes, you do. You have it now. But not yet. That was one of the favorite lines of some of our teachers at, at the Bible school and the seminary. 
now and not yet. Fact is, as soon as we trust in Jesus, we can be certain that our sins are forgiven. He shed his blood and is at the Father's right hand interceding for us with his blood. Are we righteous? No. But do we stand as righteous before God? Absolutely. When we're trusting in Jesus and in what he's done, absolutely. We stand as righteous before the throne of God. If Jesus does not return first, will I die? Yep. You will. Will you be in the presence of God if you're trusting in Jesus? You'll be with Christ in the presence of God, even as now by faith we are, if you remember our call to worship. It says that we're seated at the right hand of God in Christ now. Even more to our realization when we die, what about our bodies? Well, more than likely they'll go into the ground. Whole or already disintegrated. One or the other doesn't matter. Will be put in the ground, and there it will remain. Till when? Till Jesus appears. To bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That's the part of salvation that's the not yet. See, our salvation, as I said last week, is complete. That Jesus died to save us completely, body, soul, and spirit. He rose from the dead, and that wasn't just a spiritual event. That was... His body rising from the dead. Body, soul, and spirit, Jesus is risen. Body, soul, and spirit, you and I are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming again. He is at the right hand of the Father. He is in the heavenly sanctuary. He's there with his blood. He's there with the atoning sacrifice, and we are forgiven. But he will appear a second time, only a second time. And when he appears the second time, History is over, and eternity is ushered in. There will be a new heaven and a new earth when he appears the second time, and we will be with him with new bodies. New bodies that don't grow old, that don't get sick, that don't suffer and are no longer in the presence of enemies that, that would long to be rid of us. Jesus is coming again. You want your faith to grow? Then take your eyes off your faith. Fix them on Jesus. The author of this letter in chapter 12 says, do that. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Just as if you were invited to ride on a wheelbarrow, in a wheelbarrow on a tightrope over the ground, way up high, you would want to know for sure that the person who was wheeling you across, was capable of getting you safely across. So also fix your eyes on Jesus, who has safely gotten us across. How do we know? He's in the sanctuary with his blood that atones for your sins and life. How do we know our bodies will be raised? Because Jesus is in the sanctuary with the atoning blood. He's there with his human body for all eternity. Jesus entered heaven itself. You want your faith to grow? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on the one who came to sacrifice for you and me, who overcame sin and death for you and me, and has entered heaven itself appears for us. For us. In God's presence. Amen. We will, as those who need forgiveness of our sins, bow before our Heavenly Father and confess our sins and know that in Jesus He finds us righteous. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you to confess that we have sinned against you in our words, actions, and our thoughts. We come to ask your forgiveness and to seek your great mercy. We come to you in the merits of Jesus Christ, not our own. Look not on our sins or our iniquity. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ so that we may be clean before you. 
This we pray in Jesus' name. Father, for the good news that Jesus came and sacrificed himself for our sins and has won the victory on our behalf. Thank you not only for placing this before us through your word that we might trust in you and you alone, but Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity too to spread the good news to those who need to hear, to those who are lost and desperate. To those who know that they're guilty and are afraid to face the judge, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you bless these gifts of those also, after the service to the Gideons, that those gifts would be used by you to bring many into your eternal kingdom. Grant this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Heavenly Father, for today and for the promise that this day holds. A promise that may not always be fulfilling our desires, our wishes, but the promise that we will always receive the very best. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for making yourself known to us that we might know whatever we go through, you love us with a love that is far beyond what we can fully grasp, with a love that was willing to send your own son to pay the price for our sin and to make us yours. Work in us, Heavenly Father, that we could rest in your hands, both as we experience the things we do enjoy. Lord, I pray that when the hard times come, you would work in us, that we would not forsake you, but always trust that your will is always best. To know that your will looks far beyond those things that we might wish for. It provides for us what you created us for, to have eternal fellowship with you and with other people that you've created, to be your people, to live in your kingdom forever. So, Lord, we pray for those who are going through illness. We pray for those, Heavenly Father, who are struggling with difficulties, the loss of loved ones. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are willing to give so much for our freedom and are willing to pay the price for our safety. We thank you for those who have done this and those who are serving us today and ask that you would bless them with faith that trusts you in all things and knows that trusting in you means not just help through this life, but means life eternal. Lord, bless and give the gifts we pray today, both in our offering and in the Gideon offering. Move us, Heavenly Father, to love those around this world to the point that we would be willing to give. And Lord, we look forward to the day that we'll all be rejoicing together in your eternal kingdom. Hear us, Lord, as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, As our hope is found in one place, let's stand together as we close with feet up our vision of 607.
God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. May he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Christ Jesus, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.